The Reddit rebellion continuing to play out today. GameStop surging again after hours with so much volatility surrounding the name. Our next guest says there should be more than a halt on the stock. He thinks the SEC should actually suspend trading altogether on GameStop. Let's bring in Jacob Frankel. He's a former senior counsel for the SEC's enforcement division, now a partner at Dickinson Wright. Jacob, great to have you. As always, what, what in your view is going wrong here? This is just a group well, of, really of investors on a, on a social media site. Well, there's nothing wrong with the free speech, but what we really have here, in my view, is a kid's gaming stock that needs adult supervision. And I think that adult supervision is probably an SEC trading suspension. Everything that's going on is certainly going to invite an SEC investigation. The whole purpose of a trading suspension, which is different than a circuit breakers, is the SEC has the administrative ability to suspend trading with our questions about the accuracy of publicly available information and you have this competing dialogue as to what really is going on at the company and what's motivating the, the trading in the, in the stock or the shorts and the longs. But also, one of the bases for a trading suspension is, you know, is a possible or potential stock manipulation. That would be something that the SEC would look at. But again, when you have this level of volatility and the circuit breakers are not sufficient or not accomplishing their objective, that really is the next option. And just to be clear, a trading suspension is not permanent. It is strict. It is a 10-day trading suspension that is within the SEC's statutory authority. And it's something that the SEC wielded 35 to 40 times in connection with COVID-related stocks. Mm -hmm. How do you prove market manipulation? I mean, how do you prove that anything that anybody is saying on, on Reddit or any other site for that matter is wrong or done with an intent to manipulate the stock price. And why is this different from a bunch of investors on an Apple thread talking about the stock of Apple? It's just Apple's a much bigger market cap, doesn't move as much. Well, Melissa, that, that, that really is a great question. That's exactly what the SEC would look at. And what it looks at, what it would look at is it, it will align what is being said, the accuracy of what is being said, and the who is the, who is doing the trading. And is there some type of big word from the last couple of years, collusion within that trading. But when we're talking about manipulation, what we're really talking about from an investigative purpose it is that the SEC would look at whether there's actual active trading for the purpose of raising or, in the case of the shorts, depressing the price of a security for the purpose of inducing others to buy or sell that security. That's what the SEC is going to look at. It's a very time-consuming process, kind of stuff I worked on when I was at the SEC and actually found very, very challenging and interesting because you really then are getting into the motivation, the communications, the timing, and the information. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, everything's fast. Well, let me ask you this question, and, and I guess I'm, I'm just going to play the role of devil's advocate and from the perspective of what I've read on, on this Wall Street Bets thread. How is this any different from a couple of hedge funds or a few hedge funds saying that they're going to go short a stock? They've communicated via email. One goes on CNBC or on Twitter and states that they have a short case, puts out a YouTube video. Isn't that the same? Th isn't that manipulation except on, on a bigger scale? These are bigger shareholders. They have bigger voices. They're the quote unquote smart money on Wall Street. They can get away with it. That's not manipulation. No, and, 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 and certainly hedge funds um, can participate uh, in manipulative activity. There's nothing that, you know, that, that, that really puts one institution over a series of individuals. When we talk about stock manipulation, I mean, I remember back in 2001, the SEC brought an enforcement case against a 15-year-old high school student for stock manipulation. So it's not that there's any particular characteristic, and certainly the institutions do it. What we're really talking about here is the conduct in connection with this stock, which is which is experiencing such volatility, and the circuit breakers don't seem to be addressing it satisfactorily. What I'm saying is that is an option. But even if the SEC were not to do it, and granted, the SEC tends to use use trading suspensions almost exclusively in the small cap space. Um, but the fact is, there is conduct here that certainly has the SEC likely already investigating. And in all likelihood, there's also a parallel criminal investigation because ultimately, if you get down to it, you marry up the fundamentals of this company with the stock price. I think there are a lot of questions and the analysts are asking those same questions. 
Mr. Frankel, it's, it's Tim Seymour. Thank you for joining us. I guess my question is really around enforcement of social media because of, of kind of the group, the group think and, and uh, the lack of disclosure. Is there anything developing within the SEC that you know, seeks to at least uh, tighten up the, the, the reins around this? Because it does seem that these forums are, are ones that, that really almost anything goes. Well, it, it, it goes beyond that, because if you look at how many cases tend to be brought around what's being said on, for example, the message groups around small cap stocks, that really is the issue. There is, you know, the SEC will not touch free speech. And what I'm saying is not in, intended in any way to suggest that people don't have the right to express their opinion. The issue is whether they're disseminating right. materially false and misleading information and for what purpose. Um, because you know, that is really the trigger for whether there is securities fraud. And when it comes to, because we're talking about an exchange listed security, as opposed to what we always talk about in terms of Section 10B fraud, the anti-fraud anti provision, there's another provision in the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which is Section 9A2, 9 Alpha 2, which talks about manipulation specifically. And that's where you're talking about active trading for the purpose of inducing activity. And I think that's what the SEC is going to look at. Um, I don't think the SEC is talking about suppressing free speech, but the source of manipulative activity very much are message boards and these informal forums. And the question is, where does it cross the line? And that's what an investigation will seek to determine. Um, just quickly, Jacob, and I'm, my producers are going to scream at me for this, but let, let's say that the SEC finds that there has been manipulation going on. Are they going to fine the hundreds of people on this Wall Street bets thread? I mean, how does that go down? No, I, I, think, I think there's a question as, what is the source of the information? I mean, it, it, there are a lot of analogies we could potentially come up with, but I think it really is going to boil down to, who is saying what and why? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you look at if you look at manipulative activity, there is frequently some type of collusive activity. People are getting together and actually planning out what they're going to say for a manipulative purpose. Manipulation cases are not easy to make. I don't want to suggest that for a moment, but I do think the SEC will bring a case as easily as it would against one or two people, as it would as against ten or more, particularly in a situation such as this. We have the level of volatility that we're talking about right. and where it has the opportunity to send a message as to what is and is not acceptable communication in the market. Jacob, thank you for your time. Good to see you. Jacob Franco. Um, we're yeah. going to have much more on this retail trading boom. Don't miss a first on CNBC interview with the co-CEO of Robinhood. That is tomorrow. Squawk Box, 6 a.m. Eastern time. Um, Dan, your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, this story has gotten a lot of attention that it's just a retail thing. Make no mistake about it. There are no shortage of hedge funds that are um, playing in this, I suspect, who, who know the game and, and they are just pushing this thing up in big, big size. Now, obviously, you can go and see all the small amounts that are trading and the frequency in which they're trading. But I just don't believe that you can have a bunch of know nothings on Robinhood doing this and, and this sort of activity, especially in the aftermarket. So I think when it's all said and done, you're going to see that institutions were a large part of this sort of squeeze. This sort of magnitude is, is fairly unheard of. I, I'll just mention this, though. This is not new to Wall Street. Short squeezes are, uh, uh, you know, as old as uh, my good friend Guy Adami over there. And uh, we've seen them before. I just think the way in which people are going about them and the way that they've been democratized um, through social media and Reddit and all this sort of stuff, that's probably what's changed here. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.